it's indeed my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all for this very popular and interesting webinar series under the dynamic leadership of dr lawrence jesuraj sir ecg update 2020 a coi heart rhythm summit it's a brainchild of leading cardiologist and electrophysiologist of the country dr lawrence jesuraj sir and this is fourth in the series and this is very popular in consultants as well as in pgs also for today's webinar we have two topics first is ecg in acute coronary syndrome by young and vibrant cardiologist and electrophysiologist dr vadivelu ramlingam sir from madurai and second topic is narrow qrs tachycardia and ecg based approach by lawrence sir himself now it's my honor to introduce both the faculties you to you first i'll introduce dr vadivelu ramlingam sir dr vadivelu sir is a con consultant interventional cardiologist and electrophysiologist at vellamal medical college and hospital and research center at madurai sir is expertise in interventional cardiology procedures like coronary angioplasties both that is simple and complex and state of the art technologies sir has more than 25 national and international publications sir has authored four book chapters and presented in various conferences seminars and debates sir is affiliated to cardiology society of india he is a member of asia pacific heart rhythm society and member of american college of cardiology and sir will be speaking on topic ecg in acute coronary syndrome and our second speaker all of you know dr lawrence jesuraj sir he is md dm ccds from usa cps ac from usa and pdf sir is a consultant interventional cardiologist and electrophysiologist at kmch hospital sir has done dm cardiology from ipgmer kolkata sir has got a fellowship in electrophysiology in care hospitals hyderabad under dr c narsimha sir sir has done advanced crt training at niguruda general hospital in milan in italy sir has a certified cardiac device specialist is a certified cardiac device specialist and sir has done observation ship in complex arrhythmia ablation sir has worked in veteran general hospital taiwan st luke's medical center in usa sir has got young in investigator award in aphrs 2012 in taiwan for mitochondrial mutation in lqts sir is a first author of two chapters in textbook on vt ablation also lawrence sir has more than 15 publication in different reviewed journal and today sir will be speaking on narrow qrs tachycardia and ecg based approach so with this introduction i hand over the session to our first speaker dr vadivelu ramlingam sir sir please hello yes sir can you uh, see my videos sir we can he uh, hear you videos are not at seen sir you have to share the screen uh, dr vadiv yeah yeah i am not getting that uh, this thing here okay no sir it's a green button on the lower end yeah uh, but i am not getting it uh, Yes, I will try to figure out. Can uh, Dr. Lawrence, can you start your uh, talk? Because there is some problem in my side. I can't connect now. Uh huh. Yeah. So shall I join from again? Yeah, you try for uh, two minutes. If not possible, I'll take over. No, no, don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay, now you can see my. Yes, yeah. sir. Okay. Full screen. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
I think you, all of you can uh, view my slides. Yes, sir. Shall I start? Okay. Uh, very good evening to one and all. I would like to thank Dr. Lawrence for giving this opportunity. And I also would like to thank IPCA for arranging this nice webinars. Uh, today I will be talking on how to approach patients uh, with acute coronary syndrome by ECG methods. So it's basically an electrocardiographic approach to acute coronary syndrome. And in this context, I would like to uh, remember Professor Haynes Wellens, one of the famous electrophysiologists who was trained around many electrophysiologists of five continents, and he's no more with us. He has passed away last week. And his immense contribution to acute coronary syndrome electrocardiographic evaluation cannot be uh, underestimated. I, I can even say he, he can be called as the father of approach to acute coronary syndrome ECGs. So I would also like to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Ash Lokanwala. So with this, I will start. So uh, you may ask me, what is, is, is it, even today, is it relevant to use ECG for evaluating patients with acute coronary syndrome? You may just see, ask me that uh, uh, angiographic, angiogram has become uh, left and right being practiced everywhere and cath labs have come everywhere. But even today, I will say ECG is the widely available and easily available technology that can be used and in a time-bound fashion it can be used to save the patient's life so ECG utility has not died so so we should learn and know how to interpret ECGs in patients with acute coronary syndrome and this is not for cardiologists this is not for MD physician this, this even includes MBBS doctors also so whatever specialty he may he he or she may be in uh, or whatever may be the situation patient can have a post-operative MA or a very operative complications, so they should be adept in ECGs in acute coronary syndromes. So what is the relevance? So how to diagnose acute myocardial infarction, the most important thing, and what is the severity? What is the extent of myocardial damage that is involved? And what is the vessel, which is the vessel that is involved? Whether it is left coronary artery or right coronary artery, all this can be picked up from the ECG itself. So it's a very cheaper method and it's a very cost effective I will say, and it can it can save the patients, especially in patients coming from remote area. And even today in COVID times pandemic where primary PCA is not being used that extensively because of fear of COVID uh, infection and ECG, uh, ECG has gained more relevance than before. So we all know that acute coronary syndrome can be divided into non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome and ST, uh, ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. We know that ST elevation acute coronary syndrome is due to complete occlusion, which is going to produce ST elevation or new D onset persistent LBVB. Non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome is usually due to a partial sub-occlusion, which is going to result in ST segment depression and T wave inversion. Right, or sometimes that can be very rarely ST elevation can be there in non ST elevation acute syndrome, but that is usually going to be very transient. So, this is generally for non cardiologists, for primarily for physicians. We have two main on the left side of the heart or on the left ventricle is primarily supplied by the left coronary artery, which divides into left anterior descending artery, which runs anteriorly in the anterior interventricular septum, left anterior descending artery, which gives rise to two important branches, septal branches and diagonal branches. Septal branches are medially placed and lateral branches supplies the lateral wall of the left ventricle and the septal branch of the LAD supplies the interventricular septum. Whereas the left circumflex artery supplies the lateral wall and in some patients supply the posterior wall of the heart. Coming to the right side, the right from the right coronary sinus of the iota, right coronary artery arises which predominantly supplies the inferior and the posterior wall of the left ventricle. Also, the RV branch of the RCA supplies the right ventricle. And, and the conduction system of the heart is also supplied by the LAD uh, or the left coronary system and the right coronary system. Primarily, the SA node and the AV node is supplied by the right coronary system and the Hessian and the infra Hessian system. But the His bundle and the bundle branches are primarily supplied by the left coronary system. So when we place the leads, we should be very uh, adept which leads represent which part of the heart. We all know that B1, B2 represents the septum of the heart because they are midline phase. And B2, B, B2 to V4 or B, B1, B2, V3 represents the pure, true anterior wall of the heart. Whereas B5, V6, they represent the lateral valve. AVL and lead one supplies the, uh, or represents the lateral wall of the left ventricle. Whereas 2, 3 AVF, they represents or uh, they points towards the inferior wall of the left ventricle. 
Whereas posterior wall, we don't routinely take V7, V8, V9. Hence, we have to see for ST depression in V1 to V4 because the ST segment depression in V1 to V3 or V1 to V4, in a, in a, in a con the context of acute crystal we have to think of posterior wall MI. So we all know that why there is ST elevation, ST elevation occurs in patients with MI. There are two hypotheses. One is the systolic current of injury. And another is the diastolic current of injury, out of which diastolic current of injury is more important and more relevant. Electrocardiography cannot uh, document more uh, very important documents like magnetocardiography. So what it says that during systolic current of injury, during the systole, that is represented the QRS, the current of injury is always directed towards the injured area. Hence, in anterior wall, I mean, there is going to be ST elevation in V1 to V4. That's the primary hypothesis. So we all know this basic thing. If, to say ST segment elevation, the ST segment elevation should be there in two or more than two contiguous leads. What is contiguous leads? If it is anterior, it is V1 to V4. If it is inferior, it is 2-3 two, two, AVF. If it is lateral, 1 AVL or V4, V5, V6. So if it should be at least in two, two or more than two contiguous leads. And the ST segment elevation should be at least more than one millimeter in height in amplitude. Whereas for posterior wall infarction and for right ventricular infarction, even if the ST segment elevation is going to be more than 0.5 millimeters, it is sufficient, right? So this, oh, this is a very common ECG you would have seen. You can see L6 or diagonal occlusion. Diagonal is a branch of LED can produce lateral wall MI, that is one AVL V5, V6. Whereas to point the anterior wall MI, we have to look into V1 to V4. Whereas inferior wall MI, RCA or L6, 2-3 AVF, right? Yes, we will show. And so we will now from here onwards, I will show all the real patients examples so that uh, the understanding will be better. So he is a 81 year old doctor, severe chest pain. He, he lives in the hills. So he has come to the uh, it's a nearby town for shopping. So he had a severe chest pain diaphoresis and he went to a nearby hospital where the ECG was done. What is the ECG showing? There is going to be a diffuse monophasic ST segment elevation seen from V1 to V6, right? Also, if you see AVR, very please carefully note AVR. AVR also shows ST elevation. So when you have an ST elevation in AVR and also in the anterior leads, it means it's a proximal or osteoproximal LED occlusion, or sometimes this can also represent a LMC occlusion also. Also, very carefully see the inferior leads. This is called reciprocal ST segment depression. So when you have an ST segment depression in the opposite leads like inferior leads, this means the occlusion is proximal. Proximal occlusion means it is the starting of the vessel. So why it is important? If the vessel occludes at the beginning itself, it is very dangerous. Whereas if it occludes at the middle portion or if it is at the, at the end of the vessel or it is a distal portion, then it is not as dangerous as the proximal occlusion. So this is called a tombstone pattern. What is tombstone? We all seen in the movies or we have seen in the crematories, like this is the monophasic. So if you see the ST segment elevation is like monophasic pattern, that it means this patient is going to die immediately. So you have to be very quick in all ST segment elevation, you have to be quick, but in this denture, you have to be quick, as quick as possible. So, so this patient, this patient presented to a center where there is no cathlar facility. So he should not be, this patient should not be referred for a primary PCA because he has to travel for more than an hour. He may die in the way. So he's promptly uh, thrombolized with retiplase. And after retiplase, you see post thrombolysis ECG analysis is also very important. See the ST elevation, the tomb, the tombstone pattern is gone. The ST elevation has resolved. Also, one important thing, there is T inversion, right? The T inversion. What is the importance of T wave inversion? So in a patient with ST segment elevation, if you see a T inversion after thrombolysis, that means the vessel is recanalized. It recanalized means so it, it may be slightly occluded. It may be still 90% stenosis, but that 5 to 10 percentage, it has opened so that the flow has started to go through the myocardium that is sufficient enough to keep the myocardium surviving. So the T wave inversion of the thrombolysis is a sign of myocardial reperfusion. So how will you know that the patient is successfully analyzed? Once symptomatically, patient will become better. Pain will become better. Arrhythmia, heart failure, pulmonary edema will improve. The patient is in cardiogenic shock and will improve. And ST segment elevation will reduce by at least 50 percentage. I has already told you, T inversion is an important sign. And sometimes you will get what is called accelerated idioventricular rhythm, right? So this is the pre and post retiplase ECG. Very, very important. So coming on to the next pattern of ECG is a 45 year old male with chest pain. So if you see this, see, please look at V1 to V5. You can see a ST elevation. Also, if you see the V1 lead, there is right bundle branch block, right? 
So what is the importance of right bundle branch block in the setting of uh, acute anterior wall MI is that the right bundle is supplied by the septal S1 branch, that is the large septal, the most large branch of LAD. So very important, if there is going to be a right bundle branch block, then it is always hostile LAD or proximal occlusion because it is the occlusion before the septal S1 branch, so which results in right bundle branch block occlusion right so very important and again this is an emergency this patient has to be either immediately taken for primary pca or it has to be immediately thrombolyzed the extent of myocardial damage is going to be very severe since it is going to be the starting of the vessel and the prognosis is not good as compared to a mid led or a distal led so you have to be quick and you have to be fast so this is the ecg in this patient you can see this is the left main and here it is blocked so normally the black color dye should go all the way. This L6 is okay, but you can see there is abrupt cut off, 100% occlusion of the LAD. And you can see after stenting, you can see a beautiful vessel that is reconstructed. And this patient survived this extensive uh, anterior volume, QRBB anterior volume. So QRBB anterior volume is always, it, 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 is, it, it tends to presence with pulmonary edema or cardiogenic shock, and these patients don't give much time. So you have to be very prompt. So this is after successful thrombolysis, after successful recanalization or after successful primary PCA, you can see the QRBB has disappeared. The disappearance of QRBB after stenting is a very good sign and, and this patient uh, is doing well and you can see the ST elevation has gone down. So what is this? Again, this is a middle-aged male presented with QRBB. So outside center has been thrombolyzed. So echo, but in echo, there is no RWMA, uh, uh, the daily function is fairly good. So in this pandemic era, if this patient is going to have such a thing, so, so you'd always check for COVID and this patient turned out to be COVID positive and is nothing but COVID myocarditis. Somehow COVID myocarditis involves the basal portion of the heart, basal left ventricular involvement is more COVID myocarditis. So what is going to happen? This patient may present with anterior volume. So actually uh, there has been a good article published in NEGM where this, this COVID patients were presented like anterior volume. I can say anterior volume mimic, but on angiogram there, 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 there is no obstruction in the coronary. So you have to be very, very careful. The echo may be, uh, the echo may not show regional motion RWMA of the LAD territory, or it may be a global hypopanesia you can see. So very important in this era. And what is this? This is again a uh, middle-aged male with crushing chest pain since four hours. If you see here, the ST elevation is seen in from V1 to V5. Also, you can see that uh, the ST elevation in AVR again, you can see this, this is the LED. See so the wire is passed here. The LED, this, the, 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 this wire should have a beautiful uh, dye filling, but here that is completely occluded. And this is ballooning and this is reconstruction of the vessel. So one of the dangerous arrhythmias or one of the dangerous uh, anterior, uh, Estillation MI is nothing but osteoproximal LED occlusion. This is another male. If you see the difference between the last ECG and this ECG, here the ST elevation is seen in one AVL, also in V5, V6, in addition to the anterior leads. This means the occlusion is proximal to the diagonal. You can see this left side panel is the LED, the left hand listening artery is occluded. See this blue arrow. Whereas you see the right side after PCI, the LED is reconstructed. Also, if you can see the side, a small branch is coming, that is the diagonal branch. So when the diagonal branch is occluded, not only V1 to V3 or V4 ST elevation will be there, but also one and uh, AVL and V5, V6. So this is what, this is a proximal LED occlusion before diagonal. So if, if, if the occlusion occurs before diagonal, you can have, you can have an anterior press lateral or I mean, that is known as anterolateral in mind. Here, here, this is a patient, 50 year old male patient, presenting severe chest pain since six hours. Drop A was positive. You can see here the ST elevation is there in one and AVL, right? Whereas what happens here, this ST is a good amount of ST segment depression in V1 to V3. And what is what else you are seeing? You are seeing a white QR. So whenever in a patient with acute coronary syndrome, if you have, if you see any ECGs either with ST elevations up or ST depression, but if the QR is going to widen, that is again one of the ominous signs, this patient will have a very critical ischemia. So white QR is in the setting of acute coronary syndrome. Why it is happening? Because of the localized hyperkalemia. Whenever there is a tissue ischemia, there is going to be a localized hyperkalemia. Your serum potassium may be normal, but the localized myocardium, there is going to be excess of potassium ions there, and this potassium potassium causes slowing of the contraction and because of that there is going to be a white QRS. So this patient if you see the uh, angiogram it was a very deadly uh, disease this patient presented with 
so this presented the he presented the left main artery uh, occlusion uh, sorry the slides are inverted but if you can see the distal left lmc is 95% uh, occluded with no flow in the lad or the lcx whereas this is after successful left main to lad and lcx stenting so what is the importance the importance is if you have a white qrs in the setting of st segment elevation or st segment depression it is very very dangerous right coming to inferior wall ma so we all know that inferior wall ma either can be due to a right coronary artery occlusion or a left coronary left circumflex occlusion it's very simple left circumflex axis is primarily directed towards the lead 2 which is primarily in the left side not in the left side but it is more towards the left side whereas lead 3 is oriented towards the right side so whenever there is going to be a right coronary artery occlusion the, the lead 3 will show more st segment elevation than lead 2 also one and avl if you see lead one and lead avl the st segment depression is going to be there and avl st segment depression is going to be more than one so whereas in right uh, whereas in the left circumflex coronary artery the st segment elevation in lead two is going to be greater than lead three st segment elevation and lead one and avl they may be an iso isoelectric st segment or they at times they can show st segment elevation also right it's very very simple so right coronary artery it's towards lead three and left coronary artery it is towards lead two. So this is what I already told you. Okay. So now coming on. So now we you can all uh, just see this is in uh, middle aged male with severe chest pain. So what you see here there is ST segment elevation in the inferior list. You can see very easily two three AVF. So but the height of ST segment elevation is greater than lead three and lead two. This is very easy. Also if you see ST segment depression in AVL, then it means nothing but what is this? This is nothing but what right coronary artery occlusion, right? So also in almost all patients with the inferior volume, you should always promptly take a right-sided V4, a right-sided leads, especially V4R, because ST segment elevation in V4R is going to say that not only it is RCA, but it is proximal RCA occlusion. So here also one more point, if you see in V1, the V1 ST segment elevation is there. You can see somebody will say this is V1 to V3 ST segment elevation. Somebody will say this is as anterior volume plus inferior volume. But this is not anterior volume plus inferior volume. It's actually inferior volume and a proximal RCA occlusion. Why do I say it's a proximal RCA? Because if V1 shows ST segment coving, ST elevation, mild elevation is there. Or even if it's isoelectric, that means the RV branch, RV branch is one of the branches arising from the proximal part of the RCA. So RV branch supplies the right ventricle. We all know that V1 is placed on the right side of the sternum which represents the right ventricle and the septum. So if right ventricle infarction is there then it means that proximal RCA is occluded. So V1 shows ST segment elevation. So this is nothing but this is RCA occlusion and this is proximal RCA occlusion and if you see the V4R here there is definitely V3R, V4R, V5R there is going to be ST segment elevation is there segment elevation in V4R is very dynamic. It is seen only in the very acute stages. If you are going to take after some time, it may disappear. And ST segment elevation need not to be more than 1 or 2 mm. Even if ST segment elevation is more than 0.5 mm, it is very significant. You can see the angiogram in this patient. The right coronary artery, this is approximately occluded right coronary artery. And you can see after thrombo section, you can see a lot of thrombos there. A good RV branch is coming from here. This is the reason for ST segment elevation in that patient in V1. And this is the final result. You can see the RCA is completely reconstructed. So very important. So what, I, what happens here? This is another patient, middle-aged male with chest pain since two hours. So what will you diagnose? How will you diagnose? Is this, is this a non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome or ST elevation acute coronary? How will you act? Suppose if you are in a PCA enabled center, there is, there is no issue. You are going to anyhow take the patient for angiogram and you have to proceed. Suppose if you are in, in a non-PCA or a non-cath lab center, how will you treat this? You will treat this, will you lyse this patient or you don't like this patient, uh, lyse this patient? So if you see very carefully, you should not call this patient as a non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. Though there is no visible ST segment elevation, you can see V2 to V4 or V5 even there is good amount of ST segment depression. So rest of the leads, there is no much change. So when you have an isolated ST segment depression in V1 to V5, then you have to always think of posterior LMA. So you have to, what you have to do, you have to take uh, and the posterior leads, V7, V8, V9. So in this patient, proximal L6 was 100% occluded. So we did a PCA in this patient and this is a very good result. So suppose if this patient presents to you in a center where there's no, no angiogram available, please do a V7, V8, V9. And if, if it is going to be more than 0.5 mm ST segment elevation, you have to lyse this patient, thrombolyze this patient. 
not just giving heparin is going to do because you can see the vessel is huge and it is proximally occluded under so posterior ulna is frequently misdiagnosed even by cardiologists and frequently under treated okay so posterior ulna is not something benign somebody will say anterior ulna is only very dangerous posterior ulna is no no it's not like that even a small occlusion even a pda occlusion even a small occlusion of any branch can produce ischemic ventricular fibrillation and may kill the patient so it is very important as i have told you if st segment elevation is there in v7 to v9 more than 0.5 mm so in posterior ulna may, may be associated with inferior ulna so you can have ST segment elevation in lead two, lead three uh, AVF. So, but sometimes postural LMA can be very much isolated also. So the the inferior leads may not show any change, or there may be a minuscule Q wave in two, three AVF that may be unsuspecting. You may miss it. So it's very very important, right? And also sometimes in V1 you have a positive R wave. So one of the differential diagnoses for abnormal R wave in V1 is nothing but. A posterior wall MI. Again, this is another class, another another classical example. You can see we want to. So you have a R wave, a good R wave is there, and you have a good amount of ST segment depression in V1, 2, V3, and if you take V7, V8, V9, there is mild ST segment elevation, right? It will not be very frank, uh, very gorgeous ST segment. It will be like mild ST segment elevation, but you should not miss it. you reverse it and you can just this is called the mirror image appearance if you see if you see if you show it in the mirror and see this is a mirror image ST segment elevation classically seen in posterior wall mi and this is another patient we can see the lpda or the mid l6 is occluded once you reconstruct a large lpda and uh, another om is coming on it's very important and there are many stemi equivalents are there and uh, i just briefly will touch on because it it will not be uh, time bound manner we cannot cover everything as i have told you wellens the great wellens who has left us last uh, week is described wellens syndrome type a and type b one is a biphasic st segment depression like Biphasic, it is positive than negative. Another Wellens syndrome is uniform. It's it's a deep symmetrical T wave inversion. So Wellens syndrome is considered as an anterior wall MI equivalent. What is that? If you are not going to uh, pick this pattern, this patient is going to have a complete transmural occlusion in a period of one week. So this patient is giving you a grace period of one week time. So please don't pass off T inversion in V1 to V3 as a Persistent juvenile refractory, uh, persistent juvenile T inversion pattern as we used to do before, right? And there's another pattern called sharp T wave pattern where there's a J point depression with which is uh, which resulting or which is joining with a convex ST segment. Uh, so this is a sharp T wave pattern. And D winter sign also I will show you all the ECG pattern. There is going to be a J point depression with a hyperacute tall T wave. Again, D winters described this is in 2008. Again, an anterior wall MI equivalent. Okay, so all this is a very classical STEMI equivalence. We should not miss all those things. And sometimes new onset left bundle branch block also can present as anterior wall MI. So I will show you all the Scarborough criteria. And it is very difficult at times to differentiate left ventricular hypertrophy with uh, acute coronary syndrome. So I will also show you an hyperacute wave is the initial manifestation in some of the patients with anterior wall MI. So what is the most important thing in just remember three criteria for left bundle branch block presenting as STEMI. So so the most important thing is concordant ST segment elevation. What is concordant ST segment elevation? If the this if if suppose the QRS is up, the ST the ST segment the or the T wave is always uh, uh, inverted in patients with LBVD. Whereas if concordant means if it is upright QRS. Wave, then the ST segment should also be elevated. That is concordant ST segment elevation. That if it is more than even if it is more than one mm, that is sufficient. Whereas this concordance is commonly seen in LBVV. But to to merit to merit a ischemia point, the that should be excessive disconcordance. That it should be the ST segment elevation should be more than five millimeters. And more important other thing is what is called uh, Cabrera notch. So in the ascending limb of the S wave, there is a notch in the ascending limb. That is one of the soft signs for ischemia. And if you have to see the divide ST segment, the height of ST segment elevation. Divided by the height of S wave, if it is more than 25 percentage, then that is one of the criteria. So, so you come here, just see this patient, and this is one more criteria. So, in a this is left bundle branch block. Why do you say left bundle branch block? Because monophasic R in one AVL and negative uh, QRS in V1, and also monophasic R or in V5, V6. But what happens in V2 to V3 if there is going to be ST segment depression? So, if in the anterior leads V1 to V3, if there is going to be ST ST segment depression, then Uh, it is very significant. It suggests there is a uh, new onset ischemia. So very important. Also, one other so soft sign is if you see in V3, V4, V5, V6. Normally in V5, V6, 
the qrs is upright but in the patient with non ischemic lvvb the t inversion should be there but what happens here the t wave is upright so an upright t wave in v5 v6 in patient with lvvb suggests it's an ischemia and you should be very careful right so so you can see here the the uh, the above vcg strip is nothing but a non ischemic lvvb where you can see the v5 v6 so the st segments or the t waves are inverted st segment depression is there whereas here there is going to be a concordant st segment elevation with the upright t wave which the, the the bottom strip so very classical and what happens this this i have already told you 51 year old male vague chest pain sometimes patient may present with a dynamic vague chest pain top t to negative but if you can see v1 to v3 there is classical You can say this is a biphasic. There is slight upright of a T, uh, T wave and there is T wave inversion. So this is somewhat can call as a biphasic T wave inversion. But when taken in another point of time, so it may disappear also. This is I told you this Wellen syndrome, and you can see there is a proximal LED after the diagonal branch is critically diseased. Nine, ninety-five, ninety to ninety-five percent stenosis. This is after stenting. So the most important thing in Wellen syndrome is if during pain. If you take the ECG, the ECG may be normal. The T inversions may disappear. Whereas if the patient is not having pain, if you take ECG at that time, there will be T inversion. So this dynamic change in T wave inversion, along with the uh, symptoms of ischemia, uh, so you have to be very careful because echo may be normal in this patient and drop A may be negative in this patient. So very careful. We have to be very very significant. And these are the ECGs very classically shown. So one is the deep T wave inversion here, and another is a biphasic pattern here. So in the so in the patient. The patient during chest pain, there is no T wave inversion, and when the patient is having no chest pain, the T wave inversion says the dynamic T inversions are very important. And D winters has described this when there is going to be a J point depression with upsloping ST segment elevation, uh, upsloping ST segment depression. But if it is going to be more than one mm, and there is going to be hyperacute or rocket type rocket like uh, T wave, then there is D wave D winter sign again. This is very classical of LED occlusion. So and this patient has to be treated again. So again, you can see this is the ECG. You can see sometimes it may not be seen in B1. It is seen in B2 to B3. You can see a point or ST segment depression, sloping ST segment depression with a hyperacute all T wave. So very classical. And in this patient, the proximal LED. You can see here. Sorry, the arrow mark was wrong. Here the LED is up. Uh, the, there is 90 90 percent stenosis here. So very important. So this, this is one of the very classical. Sometimes the ECG changes may be normal at initial presentation, but we have to when you have to take serial ECGs, the changes may evolve uh, uh, sequentially. So this is a patient presenting with chest pain of 15 minutes. They come to the hospital. We can see there is very insignificant ST segment depression in 3 and EAVF, right? If you see after some time, you can see the T waves in the anterior V2 to V3. They become that they, they are they are trying to become taller. They are trying to project themselves. Whereas if you see here. Now the changes have become more prominent. Like right? you see, B2, B3, there is some ST segment depression, and there is a hyperacute T wave. Also, if you see the inferior leads, there is going to be a good ST segment depression. So what I'm trying to say here is, sometimes the reciprocal changes will come first before the you know, the primary change. Also, initially the changes at the first ECG may look normal, and you cannot dispose the patient as having a non-cardiac chest pain at this ECG. Okay, your ECG is not significant; you can go home. No, always take at least four ECGs in a period of at least over a spread over a period of six hours. And if it is going to be uh, if it is going to be completely normal and aided by other biomarkers and echo, then only out of discharge. Otherwise. Please be prudent because we have missed some of the very important patients like that. Uh, the, some of the patients, some of some one of the ex MLAs have been labeled as uh, normal ECG. So he he went up. Uh, he has to travel uphill. While traveling uphill, he had a severe recurrence of angina and uh, he had uh, sustained a cardiac arrest. So uh, so so by a by election was conducted for that. This was the history. So what I'm trying to say that so in patients uh, with acute coronary syndrome, our patient is present in chest. So you have to take serial ECGs. That is one of the very very important things. So this is all I have told you, and this is the patient. You can see that patient. If you are going to ask the patient to go to the home, he is going to go to home and have an anterior wall MI. So this is somewhat flowing. 99 percent stenosis, but there is going to be a TME2 flow is there, and this is after successful angioplasty. So it is very very difficult sometimes. CKD patients can present with the STEMI because they have already have left ventricular hypertrophy. So now how to differentiate left ventricular hypertrophy? from stemi it's, it's it's very difficult so what are some criteria are there suppose if there is going to be st segment elevation in more than 3 leads it points stemi right also like lvvb if the height of st segment elevation by s wave if it is going to be more than 25 percentage then again it suggests ischemia 
and there is one one phenomena called overshoot phenomena if, if it is going to be a symmetrical t wave inversion then it is ischemia if there is going to be asymmetrical that is t waves are inverted but is overshooting above the baseline then it is left ventricular hypertrophy right so these are and t wave inversions also suggest if, if we we want to v3 in a patient with lvh there is going to be t wave inversion then it is a stemi so but it is sometimes we may miss it some uh, sometimes it is very difficult to differentiate and coming on to the avr lead so in ecg avr is called the orphan lead because there is no company there is no contingency for avr lead because for v1 there is v2 to v4 they have relatives for v3 leads to 3 avr for relatives whereas avr is an orphan lead but avr lead is often times it is a very important lead because it it implies ostial led or lmc occlusion the st segment elevation in avr can be seen in triple cell disease also Uh, st segment elevation in avr can be seen in proximal rc occlusion also so coming on to non st elevation acute coronary syndrome we know that st segment depression or t wave inversion is going to be there so st segment depression is divided into an up sloping st segment depression horizontal st segment depression and down sloping so we know that up sloping st segment depression is not that dangerous when compared to a horizontal or a down sloping st segment depression right in up sloping st segment depression after 80 milliseconds j point is is and more than 1.5 mm or more than 2 mm is significant otherwise it is not that uh, dangerous okay so sometimes this patient is non st uh, non st elevation acute coronary syndrome may present normally the ecgs may not show anything but their angina may be very significant so uh, this is because of this phenomena the latest definition for ecg uh, have come up with biomarkers also so in addition to ecg you have to corroborate with other uh, echo or you have to corroborate with biomarkers also now biomarkers are available in almost all the centers so please before labeling the patient as uh, having a normal ecg uh, or non cardiac chest pain we have to corroborate with everything so this, for example this patient if you see this ecg is completely normal you can see here but what happened here L6 is showing critical stenosis. What happens to LAD? LAD again showing 90% stenosis. So PDA is again. So it's a critical. So it's a very tight triple cell disease. I can say, but what this example is to show you that patient with chest pain should not be ignored based on a normal ECG alone. Sometimes the biomarkers can also be negative. That is what we call it as unstable angina. So so the patient can have critical block cells where also in presence of even normal ECGs. Please do subject them to other forms of modality. Right. so troponin has become very important so with high sensitivity troponin the sensitivity is higher but specificity may not be that good okay just i will skip all the slides because this is not mainly on ecg is okay this is another patient who brought to was brought to the er with a history of resuscitated cardiac arrest outside resuscitated by bystander cpr and ecg this is ecg after 6 so very carefully if you see the qrs are wider so this 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 alone history of cardiac arrest Followed by a wider QRS alone is suggestive of a very ominous ECG acute coronary syndrome. And you can see AVR again. There is going to be ST segment elevation in AVR, and there is going to be ST segment depression in most all other leads. This, this what does this imply? This implies it's either a left main occlusion or a triple cell disease. And if you can see the angio, this is only the left main stump is there. So it should give rise to one LAD. It should give rise to one L6, but it is occluded. So it's a proximal or mid LMC occlusion. This is after stenting. so so this is a very very important so uh, this is another patient chest pain pulmonary edema and cardiogenic shock again if you see there is st segment depression is there in almost all the leads one avl b5 v6 two three avf but if you see avr so if you have a diffuse st segment depression in all the leads except in avr where there may be st elevation we have to think of lmca or or triple cell disease and you can see it's very classical this left main mid shaft left main is critical is critical 70 to 80 percent stenosis l6 stenosis is there led is disease so this is this, this is the pattern what was called lmc pattern or tvd pattern post pci you can see the ecg is uh, as, as quite normalized as so again again there is diffuse st segment depression everywhere 2 3 avf v5 v6 but st segment elevation here we are you can see this left main very very critical disease and this patient underwent cabg after cabg the changes resolved completely right another patient there is a diffuse st segment depression and st segment elevation avr and again you can see the nasty presentation the distal lmc is completely occluded whereas the lmc is completely thrombosed and stenosed and l6 also diseased and this patient underwent successful uh, stenting and this is after successful lmc to led and lmc to l6 stenting 
So again, I told you in CKD patients, sometimes it is very difficult. In CKD patients, hypertensive patients, person having chest pain, it may be non-cardiac or cardiac, but it is very times it is very very difficult to uh, diagnose which which of them have. So what are the criteria? Just three four criteria I will say you. There is going to be a symmetrical T wave inversion, then it more often suggests ischemia. The the phenomenon of overshoot. What is overshoot? Is I will just show you. So if you can see, you can see here. There is a T wave inversion is here, but the ascending limb of the T wave it is going to cross this. This is the TP segment. So if if it is going to cross the baseline, if it goes above that baseline, that is called a T wave overshoot. And here, what is called T wave overshoot is there. And this T wave inversion is not symmetrical. You can see the descending limb is shorter than the ascending. So when you have an asymmetrical T wave inversion, and when you have a overshoot, then it means that it is LVH. Whereas in patients with ischemia, there will be a symmetrical T wave inversion. And there will not be any overshoot. Okay, so so I think I have got some time. I will just briefly go through arrhythmias in acute coronary syndrome. It's very important when you are evaluating a patient with ECG with acute coronary syndrome. Some of the arrhythmias you should be very familiar because it's not the ischemia; it is the arrhythmia that is going to kill the patient. So this is the common arrhythmia in the patient in a patient with inferior volume. You can see there is going to be diffuse ST segment elevation everywhere. Two sorry in the inferior limbs, two three ABF. Whereas three and two are almost equal, but if you can see, AVL ST segment depression is more than lead one ST segment depression. It means it is an RCA uh, occlusion is there. Also, if you can see in B1, there is going to be ST segment depression here. It means that it is an acute inferior plus posterior wall MI, right? Also, what is the rhythm? Why there is going to be bradycardia? There is going to be complete or block. There is no clear cut PQRS relationship, and there is diffuse bradycardia. So P and QRS are not related to each other. So complete or block is one of the common arrhythmia seen in patients with acute inferior wall MI. And we all know that. Uh, so what is polymorphic VT? Polymorphic VT when the QRS morphology is changing. And the, axis, and the axis is changing, then we call it as polymorphic VT. So polymorphic VT in a patient with chest pain always indicates an acute ischemia. A scar VT, it's a monomorphic scar VT. What is monomorphic? The QRS are regular, their axis is regular, their morphology is regular. So when you have a monomorphic VT in a patient uh, with a history of CAD, it means that this patient already had history of uh, old MI somewhere in the recent past. Maybe one year back, maybe two year back, maybe twenty years back. But more often, monomorphic VT doesn't occur in the setting of an acute coronary syndrome. It occurs because of a scar and a reentry phenomena. That means that the MA has occurred in the remote past. So whereas polymorphic VT, when there is, you can see very clearly here the QRS morphology is upper side. It is changing like anything. So when you have a poly, what is polymorphic? Different morphology. When you have this, then you ought to always suspect acute coronary ischemia, and you should have a lower threshold to treat this arrhythmia. And uh, you should just uh, cardiovert them and take the patient to cath lab and treat aggressively the patient. So another patient, very classical, this is taken from the circulation article. You can see, you can see the V1, V2. There is going to be some ST segment elevation is there in V1. Uh, immediately, what happens? There is a VPC coming on, and this VPC is falling on the T wave. And when there is myocardium is at ischemic uh, pre, when the myocardium is completely ischemic, and when a depolarization event comes. Or tries to fall into the repolarization zone, then this is a very classical VF or uh, polymorphic VT is triggered here. And what happens here? This patient has gone into ventricular fibrillation. So the, the extreme last slide shows ventricular fibrillation, whereas the other shows showing R anti phenomena initiating a polymorphic VT. So very very dangerous. This is actually this is one of the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in patients with anterior wall MI, or even for that matter even inferior acute STEMI. So what happens here? This again another patient acute inferior wall MI. You can see two three AVF or a, a acute or subacute, maybe two three days duration. But what happens here? You can see in B1 there is one LBV pattern, one RBV pattern. So the QRS morphology is alternating, but it is regular. There is some uh, regularity is there. So this is called a bidirectional ventricular tachycardia. So when there is a LBVB and RBVB, that is B1 showing negative QRS, then a positive QRS. So when a VT is happening and we have an alternating LBVB and RBVB. And it suggests that it's the bidirectional VT, and again, bidirectional VT predominantly occurs in the form of acute ischemia. So, polymorphic VT and bidirectional VT predominantly occurs in the setting of acute ischemia, whereas monomorphic VT usually occurs in the setting of an old MA. So, very, very important. This is what VT in the setting of old anterior MA. I have told you very clearly. This is the, all the if you see V1, all are upright, regular. If you can see uh, all the other, if you see V4, also all upright, regular. So. So this monomorphic VT suggests it's a scar VT.
so what is this rhythm so we all know that what is this uh, so this is what is this patient this patient is again having a qr bbmi v12 v3 v4 so this is an acute anterior wall mi so suddenly what happening is here you can see this is the sinus rhythm you see the l2 rhythm strip this p wave qrs right p wave qrs this qrs is normal suddenly what happens the white qrs emerges and the pqrs relationship is lost so this is nothing but an idioventricular rhythm right idioventricular rhythm uh, need not always uh, rhythm or uh, represents the successful recanalization okay so whenever a uh, idioventricular rhythm happens there is going to be the isorhythmic av dissociation more often the p wave is going to hide inside the qrs so it's a very classical this patient is having a sinus rhythm here then idioventricular march of idioventricular rhythm complexes then again sinus rhythm then again idioventricular rhythm complexes so the very very classical all this rhythm disturbances you have to be very interested and you have to start analyzing all these things just by diagnosing and treating acute coronary syndrome you should not be very happy just you have to uh, dig more deeply into the ecgs and i already told you these are the stemi mimics we have told you and and uh, coming on to stemi mimics sometimes non cardiac conditions can present as stemi like i told you covid myocarditis is one example the other other patterns like a normal left ventricular branch block or an acute pericarditis hyperkalemia hypercalcemia sometimes very commonly early repolarization syndromes all these things can present as stemi and sometimes patients have been thrombolyzed for non cardiac conditions right especially brugada syndrome patient brugada syndrome you know that st coving is going to be there and v1 v2 v3 and very important it's very easy to differentiate an acute pericarditis from other forms of uh, ischemia because there is going to be st segment elevation in almost all the leads except in avr and v1 where there is going to be st segment depression and in all the leads there is going to be a pr segment depression there is in avr and v1 there is going to be pr segment elevation it is going to be there then it is going to be acute pericarditis and more often this patient have will have pericardial rub and what why it is so important is that patient of anterior wall may subjected to a triple sl disease subjected to cabg in the post op they may call you saying that this patient has a fresh st segment elevation right so you have to very carefully ascultate you have to do a, a echo and please don't uh, again thrombolyze this patient so this just you have to you have to be very good at differentiating an acute pericarditis from an acute ischemic pattern so because in that post op setting st segment elevation post cabg can happen due to two reasons one is due to pericarditis another thing due to graft occlusion because the treatment is going to be helen haven difference between these two conditions you should be adept you should be very confident in differentiating between the two diagnoses and 58 year old female uh, having frequent missed beats giddiness epigastric pain and vomiting and uh, and, and the patient is on digoxin for valvular heart disease so what is the rhythm going on you can see it's a junctional so you can see there is going to be good amount of st segment depression right a reverse tick sign and there is a overshoot of the t wave this very classical of digitalis uh, rhythm so if you have a st segment depression which is reverse tick sign and there is going to be a t wave overshoot this is called digitalis effect but what is digitalis toxicity when there is going to be arrhythmias like av blocks or or automatic increased uh, ectopic related junctional tachycardias so you call it as digitoxicity right so this patient has a feature of toxicity this was the baseline ecg of this patient and this is after correcting potassium and stopping with oxygen this patient so so sometimes patient may present with chest pain breathlessness with this ecg uh, what i'm trying to say that this patient should not be treated as post op wall mi or this patient should not be treated as non st elevation mi right should not give fn all those things just uh, try to illustrate the drug history try to illustrate the other history especially digoxin try to seek for electrolyte imbalances all these things are very very important this is another patient 15 year old female patient with severe chest pain so tachycardia is there tachypnea is there desaturation is there what is ecg showing ecg showing non non specific st segment depression in in uh, b2 b3 all these things right so trope is also positive so it's so very important trope can be positive in a lot of conditions like it can be positive in myocarditis it can be positive in pericarditis it can be positive in ckd it can be positive in volume overload it can be positive in cardiac contusions it can be positive in pneumothorax it can be positive in uh, in severe systemic sepsis also positive or in state uh, multi organ dysfunction can be positive just by looking up st segment depression just by picking up a positive trope don't treat the patient as a kid 
performed because clinical examination are rough background history and drug history alternative balance is very important and see this patient x-ray shows a large pneumothorax and CT showed a ruptured bullet. So if you're going to give heparin antiplatelets in this patient, it is going to worsen the situation. So please have a, a quick clinical examination. Uh, if, if the R entry is not good, then you have to suspect uh, uh, this uh, like pulmonary conditions also. In So what happens this patient, 40 year old male patient with chest pain, shortness of breath and status epilepticus, right? So this is the ECG and there's severe tachypnea is there, 40, respiratory rate is 40. And you see the saturation is 80 percentage. Right? and the patient is in hypotension. And he are almost arrested on the door of our emergency. So what is the diagnosis here? It's a very classic pattern. You can see sinus tachycardia is going on and the background of tachycardia, tachypnea, and there is also status epilepticus. Okay, and if you can see S1, so a lead one is showing S1, and if you see in lead three, there is Q wave is there and T wave inversion is there. So S1, Q3, T3 pattern, along with sinus tachycardia, along with evidence of RV strain. If you see in the V1, R by S ratio is more than one. Normally in V1, R wave should be shorter. If the R by S ratio in V1 is taller, then one of the indications is RV strain along with ST segment depression and T wave inversion. So from this itself, you should diagnose this is a case of acute massive PT. And this patient did not give us time to ship for CT pulmonary angiogram because he arrested. So CPR started and this patient was given thrombolysis. Okay, just a quick screening echocardiogram showed RARB dilated and, and we started immediately and this, this, this is done after thrombolysis and this patient is coming to regular follow-up but two years follow-up. So, so this is very important. We should all uh, emergency physicians and all MD physicians should know how to do a basic echocardiogram to look for LV function and this, this echocardiogram classically showed a dilated RARV. So if you have sinus tachycardia, desaturation, hypoxemia, hypotension with a dilated RARV in any setting, post-operative state or chronic illness patient or any chronic hospitalized patient, elderly patient, with or without DVT, you have to suspect pulmonary thromboembolism. It is not always important to have a uh, DVT, right? This is another elderly lady, frail lady, presenting with chest uh, pain. And when you, the drop was weakly positive, echo was normal. But what happens when you touch this patient, this patient was having severe tenderness. So why should a patient of acute coronary syndrome should have a severe tenderness? Just if you mildly palpate the chest, even if you do for an ascultation, if you slightly press, this patient was wincing with pain. So what was the diagnosis? This definitely no acute coronary syndrome patient will wince with pain when you're going to palpate or when you're going to just... So there's nothing but this is a patient of multiple myeloma with a lot of osteoporotic lesions. So again, these patients, due to some calcium disturbances, can present with non-specific ST segment changes and they will have chest pain and drop A was elevated in this patient due to renal involvement. So this patient, so you can see the classical soap bubble appearance here and there's nothing but this is, this is again, I can say multiple myeloma presenting as a uh, yeah, uh, yeah, ACS mimic. Right. This is another patient with a past history of open heart surgery. ECG is showing left ventricular hypertrophy with strain pattern. There is ST segment depression in lateral leads. Again, he's having chest pain and the drop eye was increased, breathlessness was there, 0 0.7. So what is the importance? See, you can see uh, this is the uh, x-ray is showing a mediastinal, superior mediastinal widening is there, and you can see there is a stent graft is there, right? So what happened, this patient was actually, he had uh, underwent uh, ascending aorta, uh, ascending aorta to uh, distal thora, DTA, distinct thoracic aorta, graft repair, but he has started leaking from distally so there is a recurrence of the aortic aneurysm and uh, this was an impending rupture. So in such patient, if you're going to the heparin or if you're going to give antiplatelets, rupture is going to be more facilitated and you're going to do more harm than good. Uh, so you have to be very, very uh, careful. So you have to take into consideration everything. This is a young male, non-smoker, synco, history of recurrence synco, but no chest pain. But if you see the ECG V1 to V3, there is going to be ST segment elevation, like it's a very classical coving ST segment elevation. It's nothing but a Brugada syndrome. Please, all of you go and read about Brugada syndrome because it itself is in a topic, separate topic. So, what I'm trying to say, Brugada syndrome can present as Andrew all I mimic. So, it will be very, very careful. So, okay, we are done with that. Just few slides, two or three slides left. This is a 65 year old male with acute renal failure, mild chest pain. Chest pain increases with respiration. ECG was up what is the diagnosis? So we all know that there is going to be ST say that is the, the, the ECG shows ST segment elevation and V1 to V3. Also, if you see AVR, AVR is also the orphan lead is also showing the ST segment elevation. But if you see the T waves are not good, the T waves are very tall peaked T waves, right? And patient is having mild chest pain. Why should the chest pain in patient like it should increase with 
respiration. This is a kind of pleuritic chest pain. And it's a case of acute renal failure. So hyperkalemia should be suspected. Hyperkalemia can present with ST segment depression, can present with ST segment elevation, right? So it can be an anti-volumic. So very important. All the electrolytes in this patient showed a potassium of 7.5. Okay, it's very important. So you have to aggressively correct. This is another patient. So what is shown here? So this patient, elderly patient admitted for sepsis with MPS. So ECG is like this. So what is very peculiar is a white QRS rhythm going on. We can't see the P wave. So only QRS and there is no ST segment also. So the ST segment is eaten off. There is merger of QRS and the T waves. So when you don't see ST segment, when you see a white QRS, you should always suspect a sine Q wave pattern. So this is a sine wave pattern, very classically seen in patients with hyperkalemia. So you should not diagnose this as a case of LBVV with acute coronary syndrome, right? So because this is this, these are all the patients, some of the patients have been treated as acute coronary syndrome with heparin, antiplatelets and statins being given, which are not required in such patients. So this patient given good anti hyperkalemic measures and you can very classically see when the anti hyperkalemic measures are given, the, the sine wave pattern has gone. The white QRS is normalized, but the T waves are still taller. And with more correction of hyperkalemia, you can see the very classically, the T waves are also normalized. So it's very, very important. These are all the EC changes in hyperkalemia, which you can go and read. And again, this is a very common presentation. So patient present with acute gastroenteritis. So they will be called. So they will be again and again frustrating you, calling for a gastroenterology or calling for a cardiology opinion, saying that there is going to be acute coronary ischemia is there. Please come and do something. So you can see there is diffuse ST segment depression almost all leads and the QT interval is prolonged. And sometimes you can also see U waves also. So when you think that you should always keep in mind of hypokalemia. So very important hypokalemia can present with myriad of waves along with diffuse ST segment depression, U waves, prolonged QT. So just by treating hypokalemia, the ECG changes settle down. You don't need to take the patient for angiogram. You don't need to treat the patient with uh, antiplatelets always, right? So what is this again? Another patient, female patient, abdominal pain, irritability, irritability and occasional palpitations. So one thing what is very clear if you see, the P waves are not very good, right? And the, the ST segment, again, I have told you, the ST segment is not there. QRS followed by T wave and the QT interval is short. So when you have a short QT interval and when you have no significant ST segment, uh, that uh, the segment is not isolated, segment is not there, Hyperkalemia, abdominal pain, irritability, then you have to suspect hypercalcemia, very, very important. These are all the easy changes for hypercalcemia. So uh, this is the last slide. So lead AVR is the uh, more often neglected lead, but gives valuable information. So posterior leads has to be taken, right side leads has to be taken in patients with ACS. It's, it's, it's not only fun to localize the artery based on ECG, but it's also life-saving. Disturbances are very important. They should be differentiated from acute coronary syndrome because hypokalemia is not, it can be life threatening, right? Hello. Hello, hi. Uh, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Shall I yeah. stop sharing? Yeah, please. Hello. Hello. Hi. I'm trying ah. to share my slides. Okay. 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 I'm not able to see my PowerPoint. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not able to see my PowerPoint uh, in the share screen option. Yeah, uh, that was a problem I also had. I think you have to go to their link and again start up. I did like that. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. You want me to rejoin? Yeah, I think so. If you're not... So, uh, so you can uh, start your screen sharing by using the share, share screen button. Yeah, I'm trying that, but I'm not able to see my PowerPoint there. PowerPoint screen is not there. At the screen, share the screen and keep the PowerPoint uh, open in the background. My background uh, PowerPoint is open. But in that, I cannot see my PowerPoint uh, there. It's coming as whiteboard and uh, Google Chrome uh, post attendee and all that. Click on the screen, sir. No, it's not there. I, I'll rejoin. I'll close and rejoin. Hello, hi. Yes, sir. I still have my screen is not coming. No, no, just click on the share screen button and there will be on top corner, left hand corner, you will find a screen button or desktop. No, there is there is a whiteboard, there is Zoom, uh, Google, both through are there. I'll share the screen to you. This is the only screen I'm getting. My PowerPoint is open. Any support is there? No, I'm from support team only. Dr. Lawrence, uh, uh, have you tried attempting again? Uh, yeah, I, when, yeah, I uh, went out and came in. Still, that uh, if I put this share screen option, I'm seeing only a, a whiteboard and Google Chrome post attendee. Just grant the permission. Yeah, yeah, given. Open your presentation. Yeah. Is that please continue? Yeah, yeah. It has come now. But I can't see. Can you see? Yeah, I can see. Yes, yeah. Okay. Fine. Let me start then. Okay. Sorry. Sorry for the delay. Some uh, internet issues. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vadivel, for excellent presentation. Now we are we will move on to that next presentation, which will be on NaraQRS based approach. Uh, by NaraQRS, we are talking about tachycardias, which have a QRS with less than 120 milliseconds. The differential diagnosis are limited. The most common NaraQRS tachycardia we are going to see in clinical practice is going to be a sinus tachycardia. Maybe nodal reentrant tachycardia, which is the most common pathological form of uh, narrow QRS tachycardia. So, next could be an orthodromic AV uh, reciprocating tachycardia, or we call it as an AV reentrant tachycardia, and atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. And some unusual VTs can be narrow QRS, but we are not going to, go into detail about that. So, if you ask me the most common narrow QRS tachycardia, you're going to see is a sinus tachycardia. Uh, if there is no underlying, if there is an underlying cause, you try to treat that. 
the most common pathological form of narrow QRS tachycardia is going to be a AV nodal reentrant tachycardia or what we call it as a AVNRT. Whenever you see a narrow QRS tachycardia, you have to look at the P waves. That's the most important thing. The second point you will always see is a uh, PR and RP relationship. This will help you to make a diagnosis of a narrow QRS tachycardia. If you look at narrow QRS tachycardia, you broadly divide them into two categories. One is an irregular and another is a regular. The regular narrow QRS tachycardias are AV nodal reentrant tachycardias, AV reentrant tachycardias, and atrial tachycardias and flutters with uh, fixed blocks. The irregular ones, the most common narrow QRS tachycardia, which is irregular, is atrial fibrillation, followed by an atrial flutter with a variable 2 is to 1, 3 is to 1. These kind of fixed blocks are not there, but patient has a variable blocks where you can see a irregular. Atrial flutter, secondary to variable blocks. So, uh, if you look at the um, atrial and ventricular rates, sinus node can give out around 50 to 180 beats per minute. And AV nodal conduction is the most important determinant of ventricular rate. In a healthy young patient, it can go up to 200 beats per minute. In an older patient, about 150 beats per minute. 150 to 180 beats according to the adrenergic drive of the particular patient. Ventricles can give a heart rate close to 40 beats per minute. We see these kind of a escape rhythm when we have a uh, patient with complete heart block kind of a situation. So the key questions in a, in a narrow QRS tachycardia is, as I told you, first thing you have to look at is, is it regular or irregular? Second one, make sure it's a narrow QRS tachycardia. By definition, narrow QRS tachycardia is with less than 120 milliseconds. That is, if the small squares, if your QRS width is less than or equal to three small squares, you are talking about a narrow QRS tachycardia. When it's more than that, we call them as a broad QRS or wide QRS tachycardia. And another thing you have to see and identify is, is there is a P wave before each QRS. This is the most important point which is going to help you in diagnosing this. As I told you, the most important thing you are going to look at in a narrow QRS tachycardia is PR and RP relationship. Unlike a sinus rhythm, your tachycardia ECG will not clearly show a P wave. You have to identify a P wave by looking into the ST segment or in the PR segment area. You will usually see a small deflection, which is not usually you see in a ST segment. You see in the uh, ECG here, you can clearly see some small deflection here, small deflections here in the ST segment area, which is not a part of a ST segment. This is a P wave, which has come after the ST segment. Same way you see here, after a ST segment, there is a small negative deflection, which is not part of a ST segment, which is a P wave, which has seen clearly. So when you movement, you see that, you try to measure the relationship. You follow the previous R wave to following P wave and continue this. From the P wave to R wave. So you look at the R wave, follow the P wave, and look at the next R wave. So the first one, R to P, gives you the RP interval. The P from R give you a PR interval. So in this example, you have a RP interval, which is very short, while PR interval is longer. So you are talking about a short RP tachycardia. The PR interval is longer than the RP interval. Otherwise, your RP is the shortest here. So you talk about a short RP tachycardia. Look at the Second example, you have R and there is a P. So R to P and again you are measuring P to R. In this example, you can see that RP is longer than the PR interval. You are talking about a longer RP tachycardia. So the moment you identify this, your differential diagnosis become much easier. So the most common form of long RP tachycardias are sinus tachycardia. And pathologically, if you look at, it's the atrial tachycardia. For understanding sake, I can tell you that if you see a long RP tachycardia, most commonly you are dealing with a atrial tachycardia. Short RP tachycardias, most of your paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias are going to be a short RP tachycardia. Uh, the most common form is a typical AVNRT and most of your pathway mediated tachycardias will be a narrow QRS tachycardia. So if you make it simple for you, the moment you measure a RP interval and PR interval, if your RP interval is shorter than a PR interval, you're talking about shorter tachycardia. 
and most common short therapy tachycardia you are going to see in clinical practices av nodal reentrant tachycardias and av reentrant tachycardias when your rp interval is longer than the pr interval you are talking about a long rp tachycardia the most common pathological variant of this particular uh, form would be a atrial tachycardia this slide may look little uh, uh, complex but it's a very simple uh, algorithm i'll go through this the moment you see an arrow qrs tachycardia that is qrs duration less than 120 seconds you look at the regularity if you see the tachycardia is irregular your regular tachy your tachycardia is not regular then you are talking about atrial tachycardia atrial fibrillation or atrial tachycardia flutter with a variable block so your differential diagnosis becomes easier the moment you see a irregular narrow qrs tachycardia next what you are going to see i already told you your qrs Uh, and st area you clearly look at if you are able to see a p wave if you are able to see a p wave or if you are not able to see a p wave you are not able to see a p wave you, are, you look very carefully in the tachycardia ecg still you are not able to see a p wave the most common narrow qrs tachycardia where you cannot see a p wave is a av nodal reentrant tachycardia this is important because av nodal reentrant tachycardia if you understand the mechanism the tachycardia comes from the av nodal area in the junctional area so your atrium and ventricle are activated simultaneously so when you see a av nodal reentrant tachycardia what happens is your atrium and ventricle are activated simultaneously so your p wave may be inside the qrs that's the reason you are not able to see a clear cut p wave so whenever you are not able to see a clear cut p wave in a psvt then you are talking about a av nodal reentrant tachycardia next one is you look at the atrial rate and a ventricular rate you have seen a p wave you have seen the qrs your p waves are more than qrs numbers then you are talking about a atrial tachycardia or flutter so the chamber which is driving the tachy uh, tachycardia is atrium because your atrial rates or p waves are higher than ventricular rates if your p wave rates and ventricular rates p and qrs are equal then look at the rp interval this is what i told you earlier you have a short rp tachycardia long rp tachycardia you see a long rp tachycardia as i told you the most common long rp tachycardia are going to see is atrial tachycardia if you see a short rp tachycardia if your rp interval is very short that is uh, less than 70 milliseconds for your understanding sake it's less than the two small squares you are measuring your rp interval your rp interval is less than small square two small squares in the ecg that is av nodal reentry the explanation remains same because your atrium and ventricular are activated simultaneously in a av nodal reentrant tachycardia your p wave may not be seen or if you see able to see a p wave also it will be very close to the qrs complex so whenever you see a very short rp tachycardia where your rp interval is less than 70 milliseconds then you are talking about av nodal reentry when you have rp interval is more than 70 milliseconds this could be a av reentrant tachycardia so i think uh, i was clear so next one we'll see is <clears throat> as i told you uh, most of your narrow qrs tachycardias they arise in the atria or at the junctional area the maximum rate of a, a psvt is dictated by the av node because most of your av tachycardias are conducted through the av node so as fast your av node can conduct that's the speed of your narrow qrs tachycardia So, if you have a regular narrow QRS tachycardia with a P wave, one possibility sinus tachycardia, which is a long RP tachycardia, irregular narrow QRS tachycardia without P waves, you are not able to see a clear cut P wave. It would be atrial fibrillation. All other regular narrow QRS tachycardia, you can differentiate by the algorithm which I already shown you. You just look at this ECG. You have three leads here. You see a uh, if you if I In narrow QRS tachycardia, your QRS width is less than 120 milliseconds. This is very regular, and if you measure the RP interval, if you see the RP interval, R to P and P to R, your RP interval is definitely longer than the PR interval. This is sinus tachycardia. This patient, uh, you should have a pulled ECG. Uh, the difference between a sinus tachycardia and any other form of a long RP tachycardia is your P wave morphology should look sinus. Your inferior lead P wave should be positive. Your AVR should be negative. Your lead one AVL will be positive. The, if your P wave morphology resembles sinus, at the same time you have a long RP tachycardia, 
then you consider a sinus tachycardia. So the sinus tachycardia, P wave will be there before every QRS, it will be regular. Usually you see a sinus tachycardia at a rate less than 150 beats per minute. Next will be a small case history. A 32 year old female is treated in the emergency room for palpitations. The first ECG is the tachycardia, which I'm going to show. And second one is after adenosine. You're going to identify what is arrhythmia. So this is the tachycardia ECG. If I uh, put your algorithm in place, you can clearly see an narrow QRS tachycardia and um, QRS with this less than 120 milliseconds. It's a, a regular tachycardia. If you look at the RP interval, um, if you are very careful, you see here, I am not able to see a clear cut RP interval. Uh, so I may say that I am not able to get a P wave clearly. I am going to see a sinus ECG here. You see the sinus ECG here. The most important thing you have to look at is look at the end of V1 after the QRS and end of QRS lead to 3 AVF. And go back and see your ECG. You see here, there is a small deflection here after the QRS and there are some negative deflection in the inferior lead after the QRS. So if you compare that with the um, sinus ECG, there is a there is no uh, deflection after the QRS, there is no S wave here. So if you look at the tachycardia ECG, there is a, we call this a pseudo R and we call this as a pseudo S. This pseudo R and pseudo S are nothing but your retrograde P waves. Your P waves are coming just after the QRS and they are altering the morphology of QRS. We call them as a pseudo R and pseudo S. When you see this pattern is a typical of a AV nodal re-entry. This is so typical. A small, you can see the small R in V1 and pseudo S waves in inferior leads. This is so typical of AV nodal re-entry. When you have an AV nodal re-entry, I have taken this patient for a radio frequency ablation for uh, curing the arrhythmia but I'm not able to induce the arrhythmia inside the lab. What we usually do in a radio frequency ablation, we take the patient inside the lab, we induce the arrhythmia, map the arrhythmia and ablate the arrhythmia. But there are some times you may not be able to induce the arrhythmia in the lab. But if you have seen a clear cut ECG, which is so typical of AV nodal uh, re-entry like this, pseudo R and pseudo S pattern, you can go ahead and ablate a uh, slow pathway because this is so confirmatory of a AV nodal re-entry by just looking at the surface ECG. The second ECG, this is sinus rhythm. There is something which I think most of you would have observed. You can see a very short PR interval. Particularly, you can see your uh, inferior lead here. There is a short PR interval followed by a delta wave. This is typical of a WBW syndrome. So WBW syndrome, you have a short AV conduction, secondary to the excitation of ventricle at the site of a pathway insertion. You will have bizarre, bizarre looking upstroke of QRS uh, because uh, there is a conduction both from uh, pathway and a AV node. So you look at conduction uh, in the QRS, you will see both pathway conduction and a AV nodal conduction. Your QRS is wide because there is a early initiation of ventricular depolarization producing a wider QRS. So this is all the what, how it looks like. Your PR interval is shock. Your P upstroke of QRS is slurred, what we call as a delta wave. <clears throat> so one thing you should like, for the sake of understanding, I'm telling you, one thing you should be very careful whenever you see a atrial fibrillation syndrome. Although this is not part of a narrow QRS tachycardia, most commonly what you see is a white QRS tachycardia because your uh, tachycardia goes through the pathway, your atrial fibrillation, when you have atrial fibrillation, your atrial fibrillation go to the accessory pathway and produces the uh, wider looking irregular tachycardia. So that, that's a very important thing to know because whenever you have a wide QRS tachycardia, which is irregular in a patient with a WBW syndrome, you are talking about a atrial fibrillation which is going through the pathway. This is very important because if you are going to give any drug which is going to block the AV node, which will increase the conduction across the accessory pathway and patient can end up in a ventricular fibrillation. <clears throat> so next one is, uh, you can look at this ECG, it's an RQRS tachycardia. I'm, I'm not able to see a clear cut P wave, but one thing is very clear, particularly you look at the inferior leads, your inferior lead is showing a definite irregularity of the QRS complex. 
you are you are seeing a narrow QRS tachycardia which is irregular as i told you the most common narrow QRS tachycardia which is going to be irregular is atrial fibrillation you can see a chaotic atrial activity at a rate more than 300 beats per minute usually it's irregular maybe sometimes it's difficult to pick up the irregularity if your heart rate is high you may have to take a piece of paper and go on looking at the rr interval your ventricular rate depends on conduction through the av node usually it is 150 to 180 beats per minute if not on any drugs which are going to conduct block the av conduction like beta blocker or calcium channel blockers your heart rate is usually in the range of 150 to 180 you will have a fluctuating undulating baseline you will not see a clear cut p wave as i already told you if there is an accessory pathway the af can be very fast because av node as i told you can conduct only at to the seat of 150 to 180 beats per minute but your pathway have does not have any control like that so your av all the atrial impulses can go to the ventricle and patient can develop a ventricular fibrillation so that's the reason you have to be very careful when the patient has a pathway and develops a atrial fibrillation the next ecg it's a very uh, uh, easy one. I think most of you would, would have picked up the diagnosis. You can see clearly here, there's a definitely a narrow QRS tachycardia. And it's very regular. If you look at inferior leads, there is something which is very striking in the inferior leads. You see the inferior leads here? You can see more than one P wave here. And there is a pattern there. We call this a sawtooth pattern. It's very clearly you can see in the inferior leads, although and if you look at the uh, V1, you, you are not able to see clearly a pattern like that. You are looking just like a sinus rhythm, P wave kind of a thing. But you go and look at your inferior leads, which is clearly showing a short tooth pattern. Sometimes this may be confusing. I always say whenever you see a tachycardia, which is 150 beats per minute, you should be, always be careful about atrial flutter. Because atrial flutter, the most common conduction is a 2 is to 1 conduction. So when you see a tachycardia, which goes at 150 beats per minute, and you look at the screen, each and every beat is 150 beats per minute. If you have seen a sinus tachycardia, I think most of you would have observed that the tachycardia rate changes. The rate goes to 145, 148, 150, 156, something like that it changes most of the time. But in a atrial flutter, if you see, if you put a monitor on and you just sit there and watch, it will be fixed at 150 beats per minute. The reason being, the atrial rate is 300 beats per minute and it's conducting a 2 is to 1 conduction. That means your heart rate will remain at 150 fixed. Sometimes you have a difficulty in identifying is it a flutter or a sinus rate because you look at V1 here, here you look like there is a P wave here, maybe a sinus tachycardia kind of a thing. To make it, if you want to confirm it, there are two things you can do. One, you can give an adenosine. You give an adenosine, what happens? Your AV is blocked. And you can very clearly see a flutter waves. You see the top portion here, the first ECG, there is a tachycardia going on. If you are looking at V2 and V3, you are not able to see any P wave. But just look at your inferior leads, you can clearly see a short tooth pattern. So what they have done, we have given a adenosine and blocked the AV node. So this has brought out the flutter waves. You can clearly see a flutter waves here, followed by the QRS complex. So atrial flutter is a diagnosis. So atrial flutter is similar to atrial fibrillation, but atrial activity is more organized. Usually they will have a uh, specific re-entrance circuits in the uh, uh, right atrium or left atrium. The ventricular rate again will depend on AV conduction rate. It will be exactly at 150 or 100 depending on the conduction. If it is a 300 atrial flutter and you have a 2 is to 1 conduction, your ventricular rate will be 150. If it is a 3 is to 1 conduction, your ventricular rate will be 100. But as I told you already, if you have an accessory pathway, you can go at 300 beats per minute. You can see a atrial conduction in the baseline. You will see a short tooth shaped uh, flutter waves. They are very easily amenable to radio frequency ablation. We have a very high success rate with flutters. So this ECG, again you can see here, uh, the heart rate is on tachycardia range, more than 100 beats per minute. You can see a narrow QRS and it's regular. So you are looking at a narrow QRS tachycardia which is regular next one i'll always do look at a p wave just i am going and looking at the p wave yeah we can see here in uh, v1 you can see clearly see a p wave so the same way i'm going to see r p and p r so your rp interval is pretty longer compared to the pr interval so you are dealing with a long rp tachycardia only doubt looking at this rate is is it a sinus tachycardia is it not no it's it is 
not sinus tachycardia because you look at the inferior leads. Your inferior leads, your P waves are negative. In a sinus rhythm, because you have a, a sinusoid which is sitting on the top of the heart, your inferior leads will always record a positive P waves. But here, what you are saying is a negative P waves because this tachycardia is coming from the lower part of the right atrium. So because they are coming from the lower part of the right atrium, your inferior leads are uh, recording a negative P wave. So you have a atrial tachycardia here. Although it's not very fast, you have an atrial tachycardia running at a rate of 100 and 120 beats per minute. And most probably it's coming from the lower part of the right atrium. So you have an atrial tachycardia here. An atrial tachycardia usually varies between 150 to 250 beats per minute. And usually does not require an AV nodal or intraoral conduction to uh, initiate uh, tachycardia. But you need an AV node to conduct the atrial tachycardia. Your AV node is going to conduct the atrial rhythm back to the ventricle. Your PV morphology will look different from sinus and PR interval more than 120 milliseconds. So your PR interval will be longer. Uh, so one thing you can always be, uh, sometimes you can be confused when you have a tachycardia running at a rate of 100, 120. When you have a tachycardia, particularly with sinus rhythm, your PR interval usually shortens. Whenever you have a sinus tachycardia, your PR interval shortens. When you have a tachycardia where your PR interval is longer than the sinus rhythm, then most probably the atrial conduction, atrial activation is not from the sinus node. So uh, to make it a uh, little more understanding, you have a patient, you have a sinus rhythm ECG, PR interval is 150 milliseconds. The patient develops a tachycardia. And uh, uh, when, during a tachycardia, looking at the PR interval, PR interval is 200 milliseconds. Sinus tachycardia, usually your PR interval shortens. But in the atrial tachycardia, your PR interval prolongs because your atrial conduction is not going through the specialized conduction system. So when you have a uh, tachycardia, have a PR interval longer than the PR interval of sinus rhythm, or your PV morphology is different from the sinus rhythm, you are dealing with the atrial tachycardia. You can look at the atrial tachycardia and identify from where it is coming. If you have upright PV in V1 and negative in uh, AVL, it is usually consistent with the left atrial focus. If you have P wave which is negative in V1 and upright in AVL, it is consistent with the right atrial focus. Adenosine may be help to diagnose the diagnosis if you can able to give an AV block and you are able to conduct uh, block the uh, AV nodal conduction. 70 to 80 percent of the time, if it is particularly if it is coming from a uh, septum or CS os area, it can terminate with the adenosine. So the termination with adenosine will not differentiate you from an AV uh, nodal re tachycardia and AV re tachycardia from an atrial tachycardia. So atrial tachycardia can also terminate with an adenosine. You have other few uh, long RP tachycardias. I'm not going to complete detail of all this because they are not very common. One is a sinus nodal re tachycardia where there is a re-entry inside the sinus node and you are, it can resemble a sinus tachycardia very, uh, very much like a sinus tachycardia. But the difference between sinus tachycardia and sinus nodal re tachycardia is usually a sinus tachycardia will start slowly. Patient will have a tachycardia and slowly comes down and stops. But a sinus nodal re tachycardia being a re tachycardia will have an abrupt onset and offset. The, suddenly the tachycardia will start and suddenly will stop. So when you have a tachycardia which exactly resembles a sinus tachycardia, sinus rhythm and have a rapid onset, abrupt onset and abrupt offset, you are talking about a sinus re-entrant tachycardia. As I told you, because it comes closer to the sinus nodal area, your P wave will be as same as sinus. They are usually very much amenable to calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. Sometimes we can take them for a radio frequency ablation. Another one is the syndrome of inappropriate sinus tachycardia. You will typically see at sinus tachycardia, but all the time heart rate is high. If you see a holter, the lower rate, the minimum rate, whatever you would have seen would be less than 100, 120. So when you have a sinus tachycardia running all the time, see sinus tachycardia has to be there when the patient has a uh, evidence of any adrenergic stimulus or anything which is going to increase your sinus rate. Maybe a fever, is exerting himself or something like that. But the patient is at rest, doing nothing, still sinus rate is very high, then we think about inappropriate sinus tachycardia. Usually you can treat them with um, uh, beta blockers. A lot of time it requires high dose. One drug which you use more commonly nowadays is a evabradin, which can have a good control over this tachycardia. Because it's it comes from sinus, you, it's very difficult to ablate this tachycardia. Although we try to modify the sinus nodal area, this is a very difficult area tachycardia to 
ablate. So, uh, because this narrow QRS tachycardia is a common clinical problem, I'll just try to touch upon the management also a little bit. The most important thing a lot of time you feel is, do you have to cardiovert or not? If any patient who has a, any form of tachycardia, may it be a narrow QRS, white QRS, and has a evidence of a hemodynamic collapse, you are going to cardiovert them. If a patient has a narrow QRS tachycardia, at the same time, patient has evidence of cardiac ischemia, patient complains of chest pain, there's a significant ST changes, you can consider cardioversion. The patient has developed a tachycardia induced heart failure. Patient is presenting with a heart failure with a background narrow QRS tachycardia, you can consider cardioversion. In atrial fibrillation, cardioversion, you have to be very careful. If the patient is hemodynamically uh, unstable, you have to cardiovert anyway, but you have to keep the patient relatives to understand the risk of stroke. Uh, it's between life or death situation when you have a, a atrial fibrillation, patient is hemodynamic collapse. You can try to cardiovert them. Most of the time, we convert with the, uh, loading them with um, heparin. We give around 5,000 units of IV heparin before cardioverting. Sometimes you can have a look at his um, eco, but uh, it's very difficult. When the patient is hemodynamically unstable, you are going to cardiovert irrespective of the stroke risk, but you have to keep the attenders informed. Most of the time, because uh, any patient who is a hemodynamic co compromise with a uh, tachycardia, you have to follow the ACLS protocol. So most importantly, if you have to diagnose properly, will guide you in the treatment. To treat effectively, you should know all the differential diagnosis possible. You have to use the patient clues. The ECG is one part of diagnosis. You should know the background history, how it started, what is the past history of the same disease, and always obtain a 12-lead ECG. It's very important because when you the patient is hemodynamically stable, there's no, no hurry. You take a 12-lead ECG because it's going to help you in telling the patient what is the further prognosis, what he has to do next, what drug you are going to give him, are you going to advise him a radiofrequency ablation, all depends on the diagnosis. So you try to take a 12-lead ECG all the time. Always look, have a quick look at the ECG. Just look at the narrow or wide. Is it regular or irregular? Is there any pre-excitation in the previous ECG? Is there any ischemic changes in the ECG? Hemodynamically unstable. As I told you, there's no need for you to look at anything. Just cardio with the patient, irrespective of the diagnosis. If the patient is clinically stable, then you have time. Take a 12-lead ECG. You can think and act. You have a diagnosis, you can give a drug according to your diagnosis. Always, whenever you are dealing with an arrhythmia, have a proper IV line, connect cardiac monitors on, give oxygen if required, immediate cardioversion if patient is unstable. If you are not going to cardiovert also, you keep a defibrillator close by. Don't run to the defibrillator when patient has developed a serious arrhythmia. Valsal is most effective when given early. Carotid massage is very effective. Facial immersion is particularly, uh, uh, facial immersion in a cold water is very useful in infants. Vagal inverse are usually not very effective uh, when your PSVT is running for some time. The patient comes with a PSVT with your, into your emergency within 15-20 minutes of um, uh, starting of the arrhythmia. It's easily to terminate. So, uh, most important thing is most of this vagal maneuver start to the patient because the patient can start early and terminate his arrhythmia. When the patient reaches the hospital, you can always try a vagal maneuver. If you are terminate, very good. If you don't, you can use a drug. The most common drugs we use uh, for converting uh, um, your PSVT is most commonly available drug is either diltiazem or an adenosine. Diltiazem is cheaper. It's as good as adenosine in uh, converting an arrhythmia. Usually give a 15 to 20 mg IV over two minutes. You can repeat with a 20 mg dose or 25 mg dose if the patient is not terminating. The only problem is you have to look at uh, blood pressure. If the patient has a good blood pressure, diltiazem is an excellent drug. You can use diltiazem to terminate the arrhythmia. The other drug, which is adenosine, is most commonly used because ease of admission and uh, good peripheral or a good central line. You have a good bolus of 15 to 20 ml of normal saline. Give a button adenosine bolus, flush with the saline so that it reaches the heart. Uh, the biggest advantage of adenosine is short acting. The moment you give a adenosine, uh, it goes there in 5 to 10 seconds, it terminates arrhythmia. You don't develop much of hypotension or any big issues. Because you have two drugs which are very good, when you use adenosine, when you use diltiazem, or can you use both uh, in any patient? This is usually. Uh, uh, decided by, I, I can give you a uh, little um, inf information on this. You prefer adenosine, 
if the patient is a neonate or an infant. If the patient has a hypotension, if the patient has a evidence of heart failure, if your diagnosis is uncertain, or if the patient has a prior beta blocker. Because if you are going to give a patient with beta blocker, uh, giving a adenos, uh, giving a diltiasm again can cause a hypotension or a synergetic effect of beta blocker and calcium channel blocker together. If the patient is on is a routine P. If you have a poor IV access, if you have a small line in the hand, some 21, 22 gauge line, and if you are trying to give adenosine through the line, you are unlikely to uh, you are unlikely to reach uh, heart. So that that time, I would rather prefer a calcium channel blockers. The patient who was already on dipyridamol or a post transplant patient, they don't respond to adenosine. Or a patient who was on theophylline or a history of an active bronchospasm. Some patients are very reactive, uh, reactive airway disease. There, you may have to avoid adenosine because they can precipitate the bronchospasm. In long term management, most common drugs we use are calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. We, we don't usually use. Antiarrhythmics in these patients. I, I rather take them for a radio rather than take, giving a long term antiarrhythmic therapy. As I told you, catheter ablation or radio frequency ablation remains treatment of choice for most of the arrhythmias because radio frequency ablation has become a very simplified procedure available in most of the places right now with a very low risk. So, the, any patient who has a um, supraventricular arrhythmia who does not want to consider a drug or you, you have given a drug and patient is not effectively controlled with a drug. Our patient has a lot of side effects with the drugs, you can consider a radio frequency ablation if the patient has a AV nodal re entry. But if the patient has a WW syndrome, your catheter ablation remains class one because the patients with WW syndrome, although may look very benign, they run a risk of sudden cardiac death if the uh, pathway conducts atrial fibrillation. The patient develops the atrial fibrillation and the atrial fibrillation goes through the pathway. It's a life-threatening condition. So the patients with WVW syndrome, it's better to for the first uh, arrhythmia or atrial tachycardia where you may try uh, drugs if the patient is not very keen on radiofrequency ablation. So uh, thank you for your wonderful listening. We had an excellent uh, audience here also, today also with a lot of questions. We'll try to answer most of your questions. Uh, I think most of our presentations are available in our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, if you have missed any of our presentations, you can always go through that. Um, now we are open for questions. I think uh, uh, Dr. Vadivil is also there. Uh, is anybody there? Dr. Vadivali there? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Hi. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Vadivali is there? Yes, he is there. Uh, I think uh, we can take questions now. Uh, yes, Dr. Vadivali has received the questions. Hello, hi. Sir, I think sir's mic is mute. Yeah, you, can you unmute that? Um, he, I think there are a lot of questions from his, his side also. Okay. Okay, let him come to uh, this thing. Uh, I'll take my questions first. Um, There is a question on uh, Dr. Vishnu Das has asked how to differentiate sinus nodal reentrant tachycardia from a sinus tachycardia. I think hopefully I told you. Uh, see, sinus nodal reentrant tachycardia comes from a sinus nodal area. So it's very difficult to differentiate it by looking at the uh, morphology of P wave. So what we usually look at is the background history. One is background history, which is important. The patient develops recurrent episodes of tachycardia without any provocation. Second, the most importantly, uh, if you have a 
abrupt onset and offset you have a tachycardia you know about sinus tachycardia sinus tachycardia comes slowly at reaches a peak and slowly weans off and patient develops a normal rate in a sinus nodal reentrant tachycardia you will have a abrupt onset and offset of action so you will have a sudden onset of tachycardia followed by period of a tachycardia and suddenly it stops so this is one way you can differentiate a sinus nodal reentrant tachycardia from a sinus tachycardia Mm. So next one again, Dr. Vishnu Das. I think atrial tachycardia is always narrow QRS tachycardia. See, depends on your uh, background rhythm. Two things can make your atrial tachycardia white. One, if patient has a baseline bundle branch block pattern. If the patient has a baseline right bundle or left bundle branch block pattern, the white QRS atrial tachycardia will go as a white mm. QRS tachycardia. Or sometimes patient has a functional uh, bundle branch block. That is, even the bag baseline has a narrow QRS, but as the heart rate goes, patient develops right bundle or left bundle branch block pattern. In that case also, we can develop a white QRS tachycardia, even though patient has a atrial tachycardia. So atrial tachycardia can be narrow or wide, depending mm -hmm. on your baseline conduction. Mm, so, there is a other thing. Ah, Dr. Vadivel is also there. So, Dr. Vadivel, you want to take your questions? Dr. Vadivel, can you hear me? Please unmute, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. You want to take your question? Yeah, yeah I will take. Yeah. Uh, there are a few questions specific to, I think, your talk. Lot of hey, yeah. and STEMI, they have asked. Yeah. So, uh, so we all know that hiatusernia is closely related to the inferior wall of the heart, right? So it can produce a local compression, or it can produce vagus nerve compression, or because of the myopericardial irritation, it can present with some non-specific ST segment elevation, uh, especially related to the inferior wall. So it can mimic an inferior wall MI, but uh, Echo may not show a wall motion abnormality, and there will not be a very classical uh, uh, ST segment elevation as we see in uh, MI. And angiography is, of course, it is going to be uh, normal. So this is again a very good thing that iris hernia can present as a STEMI mimic. And uh, is there any possible role for lignopain prophylaxis in acute MI? So I don't think so. Uh, uh, routinely giving lignocaine in acute MI patients is not going to salvage the patient because we have to treat the underlying cause. So we have to treat the underlying, we have to open up the vessel. Suppose if the patient is having frequent uh, NSVTs or VTs, then lignocaine has a role. As a general uh, pro prophylaxis, I don't think uh, it is. it has a role. Criteria for diffuse ST segment depression. So what is specific ST segment depression is horizontal ST segment depression or downsloping ST segment depression. Uh, more than 0.5 mm is significant. Diffuse means you you go you, you are going to get this uh, C segment depression in many reads like inferior plus anterior or inferior plus lateral. That is called diffuse, not uh, restricted to one set of leads. Any specific criteria to label as non-specific ST segment? Yes, if you have very uh, a kind of uh, upsloping ST segment depression less than 1.5 mm or uh, uh, <laughs> ST segment depression less than 0.5 mm, then it is, they are called non specific ST changes. What is called R anti phenomena? R anti phenomena is that if, if a VPC comes and if it is going to fall on the uh, descending limb or on the peak of the T wave, then it, because that peak of the T wave or the descending limb of the T wave is the vulnerable zone, right? So any event, any systolic event going to happen during that vulnerable period, it is going to induce ventricular tachycardia, usually polymorphic BT or VF. The other question is, RCA occlusion with CHB, how long to wait for spontaneous resolution? This is a very good question. Uh, maximum, we should wait for 14 days. This is a maximum time, two weeks. So if a patient with uh, CHB due to RCA occlusion, predominantly majority of them, they are going to recover within 14 days. Uh, this is so important in patients with QRBB entry volume, I mean, presenting with complete automatic. So at the end of the 14 days, uh, it's ideal to see for HV interval if possible. If suppose if, if, if it is not improving, then it is, uh, it is good to go on put a catheter in the ace bundle region 
to put one consider in the ventricle RV and measure the HV interval. If it is going to be more than 70 milliseconds, then a pacemaker is indicated. If not so, uh, then we can wait also. So usually it is two weeks max. Atrial infarction, which lead shows better P wave changes. What's the significance? Which vessel is commonly blocked? Isolated atrial infarction is very, very rare. I have not seen. Uh, usually atrial infarction, uh, atrial infarction per se is very rare entity. It is usually seen in association with either an RC occlusion or LC occlusion, more commonly with RC occlusion. Usually it is diagnosed as PR segment elevation. Sometimes we got what we have called TA wave. What is TA wave? It is the T wave related to the atrial repolarization. That is called TA wave. So they either call it as PR segment elevation or PTA segment elevation. Uh, usually well seen in uh, leads V1. Sometimes the later leads like V5, V6, right? So, but again, idle infarction is very, very, very rare phenomena. And even if you're going to miss, because if you, you always, just, uh, and it may be associated with arrhythmias, more commonly with atrial fibrillation, because we know that LA, the supply to left atrium usually arises from the left circumflex, and the RA is usually supplied by the right coronary artery. So either RC occlusion or L6 occlusion is going to cause, along with inferior volume or lateral volume, that is going to be atrial infarction. What conditions should be considered STEMI equivalent? This I have already given you. Uh, winter's sign, or d uh, wind sign, Wellen syndrome, LVVB presenting with MI, then LVH can sometimes mimic, uh, uh, can, can present a STEMI. So these are all the primary STEMI equivalents. How to make OM occlusion in STEMI changes? Sometimes OM occlusion presents a very, uh, very minimal ST segment elevation in 1 and AVL, sometimes along with V5, V6. So isolated OM occlusion is again sometimes difficult to diagnose. But usually, if it is going to be a large OM, usually it presents as a lateral volume. It can present as a lateral volume. When can we consider ST segment depression? I told you if it is more than 0.5 mm, uh, ST segment uh, depression is significant. First, sir, first recanalize CCG in biphasic T wave. So basically, they are asking about, I think, Wellen sign. Wellen sign can be of type A, type B, either it can be a uh, uniformic or uh, monophasic ST, uh, T wave inversion, like deep symmetrical T wave inversion, or it can be a slight upright T wave followed by a T wave inversion, biphasic. It doesn't suggest recanalization. When, when do you call recanalization? When a vessel was completely occluded, and after occlusion, if you either thrombolize or if you put a stent, then it opens, then it is called recanalization. So in Wellen syndrome, it is critically stenosed LAD that is going to close in a week's time. So we cannot call it as a sign of recanalization. T wave inversion can happen after recanalization, but Wellen sign doesn't suggest the, the recanalization. It suggests that the proximal LED is significantly stenosed. It is going to approve. That's what. Does ECG required for chronic? There's no ECG can, is not that useful in patients with chronic MIs because it is going to show only Q waves. So if, if there is going to be only ST segment elevation, especially in single vessel disease, it is the, the utility of ECG in identifying ischemia is, is going to be great. In multivessel disease or subtotal occlusion, the, the sensitivity and specificity comes down. Uh, uh, any other question I should answer? I think I've answered almost all. I think uh, regarding tachycardia, I think uh, Dr. Lawrence you can answer. Do you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. I think we are, uh, we are done. I think most yeah. of the questions have been answered. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Vadivel, sir, for being with oh, us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you it's all. Nice... I... Yeah, please. Please go. Yeah, it's a nice uh, juncture. It's nice we share knowledge and we learned a lot from you. And uh, I think I uh, thank all the audience for uh, participating. And uh, any other questions, they can mail us also. We can. We are always uh, ready to help them out. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah. You. Sir, I'll just put a word of thanks. Yeah, please. Yeah, once again, very good afternoon to you all. It was indeed a great session and treat to listen to both the faculties of today. Uh, my sincere thanks and gratitude to Dr. Lawrence Jesuraj, sir, uh, as well Dr. Vedival, sir, for giving us an opportunity to host this webinar. And um, I am also thankful to all of you viewers for sparing your time and logging in for today's webinar. So heartfelt thanks. Thank you so much. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you.